Hi, this is Outlaw Bookseller and well, the moment has come. This week, 45 years ago, on April the 15th, which I think falls on Friday this week, um, my favourite album of all time was released. I can't say I bought it the day it came out. I think I got it about six months after that. I was still very young. Um, so 45 years ago, 1977, I was 13 in April, I was 14 the following month and um, for many of us, you know, the release of Ratus Novedicus was a life defining moment and it still remains my favourite record of all time. So I thought I'd take a look back at Ratus and celebrate its magnificence and I hope you will enjoy sharing this with me and I'm sure you have your own feelings and um, your own opinions about the record, but here we go. So where did, where did it start? Well. Really, if we look at it from the music industry background, it actually started with another band. In, I think it was September 1976, this album, Stupidity, by Dr. Feelgood, which is a live album, their third album, and this is a Japanese one, as you can see from the OB, was released and went to number one. And Dr. Feelgood, had, they hadn't any hit singles then, lots of live acclaim. And they were the sign that something was changing, something in the air was changing. This is a reissue. And I believe this came with a, a free single from United Artists. This is like a, this isn't a UA original. This is a um, gold vinyl reissue from a few years ago. And it went to number one. I think it was only number one for one week. Um, but it signalled to the UK music industry that there was an interest in music which had come from the street, um, from musicians who were touring, playing hard and fast and down to earth and, you know, addressing the concerns of, of ordinary people and just giving us some superb rock and roll. Um, UA, a great label, you know, they later issued records by the Stranglers and Buzzcocks. Before that, um, they'd been champions of underground acts like Hawkwind. And they, with this, set the template for what might have become Rattus Norvegicus. Rattus Norvegicus um, was originally meant to be a live album called Dead on Arrival. I'm sure, you know, if you're a fan, you'll know all this. There's nothing surprising about it. But it is interesting to reflect on Rattus in the lens of stupidity because, of course, when Rattus finally appeared, there was a free single. That's an unplayed original there, I'm going to show you later on. And the flip side of the single, Choosy Susie on one side, of course the other side was Peasant and the Big recorded at the Nashville in um, I think November 76. And that was from the unreleased live album. The um, tapes were judged to be not of sufficient quality, otherwise we would have had an opening live album. Inspired obviously by UA's success with Stupidity. So we didn't get that, but we did get a record with a free single like Stupidity and we got a very sort of raw street record. So let's just take a look at Rattus and, you know, talk about it and the discography and what have you. Not in, I'm not going to give you catalog numbers and stuff because I don't really go there. I'm sure some people do and that's great. But of course, um, Rattus was preceded by this single, Get a Grip on Yourself. This is an original. Um, with, as you see, it has the paper sleeve because it's frayed there. Do some some years of um, many years and years of um, of play and wear. Later, he said with a harder card so sleeve, and there's the single itself. And as you see, I popped it in a um, UA sleeve there. And of course, it was a bit of a mystery because you know grip should have gone to high up in the chart and it didn't. There was that mysterious thing. We'd only got to number 44 and there was a mistake in the combination of the charts, which has been very suspicious because of course it happened a few years later again with the Stranglers with the police and um, the Raven. And you know, we know, we know what would should have happened, but it didn't. So there was a disappointing showing, um, but it sold. And then of course, when Rattus came out, it really sold. It got high up in the charts. Um, in a review I wrote, I quoted number two. I think it was actually number four. And um, I think I've got various copies here, but I, I really should show you. This is, a, this is not my first copy. My first copy was worn out. But this is an unplayed original, which I got with a shrink wrap still on it about 15 years ago. Um, 
and the shrink of course was hard rather than a soft shrink so I knew it was authentic it was a copy which had been sent out to Japan it had stayed there all those years never been opened and I'm just going to take it out now um, and this is a mint pristine unplayed original of Rattus Norvegicus. I will never ever play this. I, I'm going to keep this unplayed until you know until the the trumps of doom. The iconic inner sleeve and of course the inner sleeve again older fans will know this story it has many things the spears indicating the Vikings of the Raven the man in black in the background the stuffed cat on Dave's lap indicating feline who holding the strange little girl there uh, bring on the new balls um, very very dodgy um, the tube in his ear oral sculpture all those things seem to be there and the iconic shot of Rattus Norvegicus the brown or Norway rat and you know if you get that book what's it called 1000 album 1001 albums you mess before you die it says about how you know the album was named after the plague rat which just shows how little they know the black rat was the plague rat not the brown rat so it was the black death because of the black rat and here it is so that's an unplayed original um, and of course um, it came as I say with the free single so this is an unplayed Susie um, and in there that is the sticker which was on the corner of the shrink wrap 10,000 copies were pressed they sold very quickly the album went straight into the charts so that is an unplayed mint pristine copy of Rattus with all the bells and whistles which is never ever going to be played so I'm just going to pop that back into the protective sleeves I have it in so there you go um, and what more can we say about Rattus? Well, we could talk about it for days and days and days. Um, so at this point in the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a reading from a review I wrote um, online on a retailer's site. Um, it doesn't go into enormous depth about the songs, but it tells you my feelings and my attitude about Rattus Norvegicus at the time. In front of you, you can see um, the corner of a Japanese card sleeve copy of Stranglers 4, Rathus Norvegicus, and the sleeve of the Simply Vinyl Limited Edition 180 gram, which I think is about 20 years old now. Um, and we look at different editions throughout the video. This is what I said. More often than not in magazine articles, books, and television documentaries about UK punk rock, the Stranglers are ignored or at best written off as not really punk. The reality back in 1977 when Stranglers 4, Rattus Norvegicus, was released was that the band were the punk rock group of choice for the majority of the original UK punk rock kids, both the Conoscenti and Latecomers, alongside the Sex Pistols. While the latter band's musical brilliance was often overwhelmed by the Jubilee Year Media Circus that their manager Mark and McLaren exploited, the Stranglers relied on their multicoloured, malevolent music and their own eldritch personas. Besides this, the Stranglers had reached their definitive lineup by March 1975 and laid the groundwork for punk rock UK by getting out there and touring the country incessantly ticking gigs everywhere from South Wales to Scotland and playing hundreds, literally, of sets until being signed by United Artists in late 1976. To an extent following in the footsteps of Dr Feelgood, whose debut album Down by the Jetty was bought by members of Blondie when they first visited the UK, which they then played to key figures on the New York punk scene, Clem Burke has been quoted on this, the Stranglers' natural confrontational attitude and snarling musical chops ensured that they changed the London pop pub rock venue in the feel-goods wake and prepping the country for something more intense. The Sex Pistols used to go and see the Stranglers play. Jet Black was asked for drumming advice by Paul Cook and Joe Strummer told Hugh Cornwall, I wish I had a band like yours, a proper gang. And as the feel-goods hit number one in autumn 76 with Stupidity, their third album, the writing was on the wall and McLaren had been building up the pistol since mid 75 too. So chronologically, spiritually and anti-structurally, the Stranglers were their own creation, not fostered by Svengali management like the Pistols and the Clash, while the Damned were similarly autonomous like the Strangs, it was the Stranglers who defined punk rock. A caveat here, 
Once punk rock became a Stalinist formula, it suddenly became punk, and this dropping of the suffix is for me the dividing line. Any fool could be a punk, but it took attitude and inspiration to be a punk rocker. As McLaren said to Howard DeVoto when Buzzcocks played Screen on the Green, your songs have real content, don't they? For its style and content that makes a great punk rock. For a full review of The Stranglers as the authentic anti-structural punk rockers, read Phil Knight's magnificent book Strangled. For original punks like myself, who could relate to the youthfulness of the Sex Pistols, the Stranglers were not boys but mature men, and all the scarier and more significant for it. The Stranglers summoned up the feeling of walking around British towns at night in the late 70s for young men, full of fear, unrequited lust, misanthropic romanticism, sick of the violence and sex we saw everywhere, the former so close, the latter often frustratingly beyond our youthful reach. Branded as sexist bullies by the music press, the band were merely honest. Young men often are aggressive and lustful. Their music is misanthropic, but it has a shadowy existential beauty, heart-rending melodic sentiments reminiscent of the doors, often pouring out of a scree of up-tempo noise like that of the Velvet Underground, but almost uniquely The Stranglers. To lay one myth to rest, their music was never a problem for women either. There were, and still are, plenty of girls at the gigs. Containing two hit singles, The Coruscating Grip, whose tumbling psychedelic organ, riff, organ riffs are counterpointed by the Coltrane-esque sax motif played by Welsh coal miner session man Eric Clark and the top ten smash Peaches, whose killer cod reggae moog and bass groove provides perfect backing for this unashamed and refreshing admission of male lust to the opposite sex, Rattus Norvegicus peaked in the UK at number two and helped the band become the top-selling band in Britain in 1977 with the exception of ABBA and the Eagles. Of course, they also sold more records than all the other punk rock groups put together in the first few years of their existence. Even now it is uncertain if The Clash and The Pistols have ever outsold them cumulatively. I'm going to put a caveat in there. I think the album actually got to number four, not number two. I think that's a mistake. The first big hit single, of course, was Peaches, which um, didn't come in the sleeve originally. The sleeve was reissued later. I think it was 78 the sleeve came along. And um, I didn't actually buy Peaches either. My first record I bought with The Stranglers was the single of No More Heroes, as I liked the title. I hadn't actually heard The Stranglers at that point. Um, and um, there's um, another variant of a UA sleeve there. So yes, we picked that up because of course, the original was withdrawn. Now this is not an original. This is the facsimile record store day one from a few years ago, which is on green vinyl. Um, I have seen one. Um, the first time I met the Stranglers um, was in um, Spillers Records in Cardiff. Um, October the 30th, was it the 31st? It was that date in October in 79 on the Raven tour when the band, um, there was the roadblock and who was arrested and went to Pentonville prison after that. That was the first time I saw them and I, they did a signing session in Spillers and um, somebody had an original and Jay Jason was saying, where did you get that from? How did you get it? Because it wasn't very well known then. Um, you know, it wasn't something that people knew about. So, so, and he signed it for the guy and stuff. They signed stuff for me as well. I'll show you some of that now. Um, but just to talk again about the original, if you look in record collectors sort of guide, it says something silly like that a mint ratus with a, you know, with a seven inch and with the um, sticker will cost you 40 pounds. Dream on. It will not cost you 40 pounds. It hasn't been 40 pounds for 20 years. You've got to find one first and then you've got to find it in a condition. So don't believe a word. Goodbye to Lose is a romantic stomper, a kind of punk song for Europe, while the mammoth down in the sewer is gritty science fiction with a Ray Bradbury something wicked this way comes carnival organ, vertiginously melodic guitar and a prog rock coda that kicked the ass of proficiency. Ugly, one of the most vicious sounding pieces of music in history, including Sister Ray by the Velvets, references Shelley and Bernal's shouted line in the middle of the song where the music stops, still shocks. Sometimes, Princess of the Street and Hanging Around remain the definitive portraits of the cold, wet, dark, dreary, but horribly exciting British street nightlife of the punk era. The album showcases the band at their first peak, recorded live in the studio, 
minimal overdubs, with equal weight given to keyboards and basses the guitar in the production that reveals them as stylists both technically proficient and quirkily unique. J.J. Bunnell, whose savage sound confirms the bass as a lead instrument in rock, up there with Eberhard Weber, Barry Adamson, Mick Kahn, John Cale and Chris Hillman. Dave Greenfield, the Hendrix of rock keyboards, whose technical ability would within a year outstrip that of Wakeman, Lord, Banks or Emerson, and he already had a better grasp of melody and structure than any of them, his riffs as complex as solos, his lightning solos out of this world. Hugh Cornwall, whose Robbie Krieger via Velvet Underground guitar alternately grated like bells struck with sandpapered hammers before pulling off solos of unparalleled lyrical angst. Finally, I must mention Jet Black, the solid, evocative drummer, whose cymbal crashes on Princess of the Streets are a perfect example of effect in simplicity. The vocals, shared between Burnell and Cornwall, are both full of ire and longing. The ultimate strength of the Stranglers is that nothing is wasted. No instrument or voice is lead or overly foregrounded. This is a band, not a frontman with a guitar backed by bass and keyboards you cannot distinctly hear. Kudos to the brilliant Martin Rushant, better known now for producing The Human League, but this was his finest moment rather than that he enjoyed with the Sheffield synthesists. So that was true punk rock in 1977, not the political claptrop you've been told. The Stranglers formed at much the same time as the Sex Pistols and sold more records and never compromised. They even had a keyboard player, a true mark of real punk rock authenticity and audacity before that Stalinist formula of clash s politically correct protest, leave it to Bob Dylan and Joe Strummer, and the uniform punk look drove the artists out of the scene. There are few records as angry, as lysurgically colourful and as decadently lyrical as Rattus Norvegicus. Hear it and live the reality of UK punk rock 1977, while marvelling at how few bands can play this dynamically now. So from that um, that day when I met the Stranglers, and they were fantastic, they were great guys, you know, and um, really, really nice. And, you know, I was, I think I was 16 by then. And this is a Dutch copy, which is the copy I had then. And um, Dave signed it for me there, and JJ signed it there. The date 79 and um, this is my go-to copy for several years and um, this is the inner is actually from a UK original um, and signed by who there is that who no that's Dave again sorry that's Dave again and we've got who and jet in the back there so that you know is pretty proud of that as well you really love that that copy so so this is a dutch one um and um i got this and i see on the plain ua label and i got this from a little record shop in cardiff which was really good for imports and um, they had a lot of them quite cheap and it was across the road from spillers spillers is still in cardiff it's on a different site and it's pretty much a shadow of his former self but it's still still worth a visit you know and it's hugh's signature there on the back um and i'll just show you there you go Holland. So that was my sort of copy of Rattus, which was my standard one at that time. And of course, you know, a lot of us then we didn't have Susie, we didn't have a single, and then it got um, specially pressed um, if you used to subscribe or if you used to buy Strangled magazine. And there was this edition, um, which was sent out, and I think they did 2,000 copies of this, I think. So it's the 10,000 original, this is three years soon. And it looks very, very much the same. I think the, the sort of discographic experts will be able to tell, but it does look the same. And here's a little piece of paper which came with it. And um, there, that came with it. And I'll read you what that says. If you can't see, I'll just show it to you. It says, um, let's see, unfold it. There you go. Um, we are sorry you had to wait so long for your record. 2000 was specially pressed us four weeks ago, but were found to be labelled incorrectly and had to be destroyed. The second batch has only now been received and is being sent to you immediately. Ah, okay, so there's 2000 theoretically destroyed. We also apologise to strangled subscribers for the delay of appearance in number three. That's volume two, number three, I think. It will be ready for the end of the month. Um, you may like to know that many, it goes on about many black t-shirts. And this is from the SIS, Strangler's Information Service, September 1980. So 1980, I was finally able to get my hands on a copy of Susie. I chewed it, of course, a friend had it. Um, my friend Beaver, hey Beaver, um, who um, was the lead singer of a punk rock band called Addiction from Pont de my hometown, great guy. He, got, he pretty much got me into the Stranglers. And this is a facsimile sleeve. 
in orange and I put that little sticker on there. I bought that on eBay, customized that. Um, and I think it came in a white sleeve. I put in a black one because the black one is cool. So that was my first copy of um, Susie, but I've got an original there as I say. And of course, when CD appeared, it pops up as a bonus track on everything. Um, and it was great to have that. And you know, it was part of the mystique that unless you were there at the beginning and getting Rattus into the charts those first few weeks, you didn't have the free single. So, you know, that was, that was quite exciting to, to get the free single. And, you know, um, we have seen other issues. This is the Simply Vinyl one, which is about, I think, about 15, 20 years old. There was the Townsend one, which I didn't buy. I should have bought. I bought the rest. And I've never played this either. It's a limited edition. It's, um, you know, I've taken it out a few because you can open up this um, specially, but I decided to keep it. Printing's not as good, but there you go. So, you know, yeah, I've only got three copies of Rattus on vinyl. I've actually got four because I've got another one here. I'm not sure what this is. I think this is an unplayed one that I got somewhere and maybe it's just that first from that first pressing with the label. I can't think where I got that one. Maybe it is my original. Who knows? So that just goes to show. And of course, you know, in Japan, we had this lovely single of Sometimes um, and back with Go Buddy Go, which of course is on the double A of Peaches in the UK. And I mean, these are still out there probably. And I got the from Adrian's Records in um, Essex to do mail order a lot then i think this was two pounds 75 which was a fortune in those days in 77 78 um because of course an lp was still only about three pounds three pounds 50 so you know but it was worth having because it's fantastic what a great choice for a single sometimes marvelous track time went on cds came and went well, then went they're still with us they still sell and i've got a few of my cds here um i think that's the original cd version which doesn't have any bonus tracks which is refreshing um still got it still sounds good um there was this reissue there was a digipack which i had but i hate digipacks i got rid of it i don't care i can't stand digipacks um this one's got um bonus tracks susie go buddy go peasant live saw the associated singles so that's kind of like a complete edition which is really good um and then there's the um 2018 classic collection um, reissue as well you know which um, has got the airplay version of peaches it's got grip 89 on it um, both versions of grip 89 the 12 and 7 inch um, my favorite cd i guess is this nice little japanese one so there you go got loads of those as well i mean we've all got these haven't we you know they're sort of fairly common things but what can we say about rat as well um for me it's the perfect record i'm nostalgic about it um, my life has changed I don't have the same feelings I had then. Inside though, I think I have. I think we all have. And you know, it's a classic record, nine tracks. There's no fat on it. It has kind of everything. Is it the greatest album ever made? It is to me, it probably is to you. Um, it won't be to lots of people, but that's the thing about rock music. It's subjective and it's personal. So here's the 45 years of Rattus Norvegicus. Um, here's to JJ still in the band, to Hugh, still out there touring um, to Jet retired for quite a while now and Sally to Dave who's no longer with us what a great shame he didn't get to see the 45th anniversary so this week I'm going to listen to Rattus a lot I'm sure you are as well I'll be raising a glass to the album on Friday and um, you know let's come back and talk about it again in five years time when it's be the 50th anniversary long may Rattus Norvegicus continue to be the greatest album that we've ever encountered. Bye for now.